Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 15, Episode 33. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, we have uh, an even more jam-packed Wednesday show than we normally do. A bunch of Steelers moves, Mike Tomlin press conference, all 22 of you. And get ready for October to be the month of Devontae Adams. You thought Brendan Ayuko was enough for one uh, season rumor mill. Well, take two on Devontae Adams. He wants out of Las Vegas. Will the Pittsburgh Steelers be his destination? We shall see. So, a lot going on here this Wednesday, Dave. Yeah, happy Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if people probably got uh, what uh, kind of a PTS syndrome, I, I, I guess, uh, from, from the Brandon Ayut stuff, but. Uh, it feels like we're going to be talking quite a bit about, uh, obviously, Devontae Adams, not only today, but until something is decided there because, you know, the the, the news dropped on uh, Tuesday that uh, evidently he wants out of Las Vegas. And it kind of feels like at this point, uh, at some time, at some point between now and the trade deadline, uh, that's going to happen. So... We got a lot to get to, so we better start somewhere, and uh, I guess we'll start with kind of the housekeeping and and being at such a long list. I might run down and go get me another cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start here. We'll we'll show some mercy, not begin with the uh, Devonta Adams conversation just yet. And if I miss something, let me know because there is there's a dozen names here to talk about that Pittsburgh has released or added or anything like that. So roster moves made official yesterday. The team officially placing James Daniels on injured reserve with the torn Achilles. We knew that was coming. Really unfortunate for Daniels having a good season and was in line to get paid handsomely this offseason. His future now uh, much murkier. Team releasing a pair of players from the 53-man roster in cornerback Darius Rush and safety Jalen Elliott. Uh, Rush had made the team out of training camp. Well, both players did, um, but Rush had struggled to get a hat the last couple of weeks was Starting the season as a gunner, didn't particularly play well, had been inactive and now released. Uh, Elliot had, you know, seen what had he had he dressed yet, Elliot, for a game, Dave? Uh, Jalen, yeah, remember he'd yeah. been uh, working on special teams uh, after the uh, after the after uh, Pruitt went down. Okay, yeah, so just some special teams work for him. We'll see if he comes back to the practice squad. That would make a lot of sense to me, but we shall see. With the offensive line injuries racking up, the team adding some veteran depth and signing. Guard Max Sharping off the Washington Commanders practice squad, a former second round pick of the Houston Texans, was with the Bengals in 2022 and 2023, playing sparingly, and then had bounced around a little bit this summer. Ended up with Washington, uh, Washington now on Pittsburgh's 53 man roster. Also, some practice squad moves here the team signing a pair of players and releasing a pair of players in Aku Leota, an outside linebacker, and reuniting with former running back Mike P. Ryan, who was with the team in training camp, team releasing uh, outside linebacker Marcus Haynes and fullback Jack Coletto in corresponding moves to the practice squad there. And the team also signing today Jacoby Winman to the practice squad, who was with the team in training camp, mainly an off-ball linebacker, but also played some outside linebacker in the summer as well. So, yeah, a lot of moves for Pittsburgh as injuries pile up as you get into the uh, real meat of the season. Yeah, uh, and I would guess they need a reciprocal for Winman, right? Is that correct? I hadn't even done the math, but I believe that is right. But I would have to double check if they had an open spot or not. They still have two open roster spots on the 53. Uh, with Rush and Elliott um, being released and um, Daniels being put on IR with Sharping being added. So that's three players off, one player on. So we'll have to see how they fill that. Yeah, that'll be interesting to watch play out the rest of the week. Uh, we'll see if we get uh, any word on that before the Wednesday practice starts. Uh, 
And we'll talk later in the show about maybe some potential guys uh, resuming practice uh, coming off of their stay on IR. Uh, we'll get into that later there, but there are a lot to chew on right there. Uh, Darius Rush, just, just they, they gave him a lot of time and just hasn't worked out for him. And, you know, he had a, a little bit of a path carved out early on to try to see if he could make a mark on special teams and be a backup uh, cornerback on this roster and just never, never could, could, you know, bite and fit and ended up what inactive, I think, uh, this past week. Right. Uh, and uh, the signs were kind of there that this might not work out with him. And now we'll have to wait and see if they think at least enough of him to get him back to the practice squad, uh, at some, po- at some point. So not overly surprising there, as you mentioned, Daniels, to the IR. We knew that was coming. Uh, sharp, sharpening, uh, being signed off the commander's, uh, uh, practice squad. That guy's got some NFL experience for sure. Uh, went all the way back and looked at, uh, what was it? The 2016 pro day circuit, Alex, <laughs> uh, what Northern, Northern Illinois, right? Yep. And we think, of course, uh, you're talking about set eight years ago. Uh, if only uh, we were, you know, we had kind of footage that we get out of these pro days or, or yeah, pro days that we get today probably would have uh, known for sure. But I think uh, the thought was that Dan Colbert was uh, at that pro day there. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. Get an experienced guy, interior guy uh, there to add to the 53. Uh, what else was more notable coming out of these moves? Yeah, I mean, those are the big things in terms of the 53. It's it's Rush and Elliott off, and we'll have to see the corresponding moves there to kind of get maybe a better gauge of, of why especially Elliott was released. I can understand Rush, he'd been passed up by you know, you know, different guys, James Pierre getting the hat over him. Thomas Graham was elevated uh, for the Colts game. So kind of writing was on the wall for him. Elliott. I think a decent chance he goes back to the practice squad right. and could be elevated if needed. Yeah, and Sharping, I'm not going to pretend like I've been watching Sharping tape lately and he's not played much in the regular season. Got a couple of snaps last year and in 2022 in Cincinnati. Only been maybe three, four years since he's seen substantial time. He was a tackle in college, but has really played guard and a bit of center in the NFL. And so he's been really more of an interior guy. I remember not being high on him coming out of college. Felt like he was a little overmatched, a little awkward body type. Um, but again, I've not really watched him lately. Hopefully it does not get to the point where he has to play. Um, and Isaac say Malu appearing to come back will, will help Pittsburgh obviously, but you know, you never know if it's, it's week four, this team it's going into week five in four weeks and this team has already been rocked with injury. So who knows what's on the other side of the next, you know, dozen games. Yeah, and with uh, hopefully Sayamalo coming back this week and with Sharping, Sharp, how do you pronounce his last name? Sharp, I think it's just Sharping. Sharping. Uh, mm-hmm. With Sharping now on the 53 and with this team needing to dress least eight offensive linemen, uh, the new guy could be the one that ends up on the inactive list uh, as that ninth offensive lineman. Yeah, if same Alu comes back and you have Calvin Anderson and McCollum and those backups. So uh, Sharping probably some time to get up to speed here. He will wear number 64. If you ever happen to see a 64 out there at some point, that's hopefully be, we don't. <laughs> hopefully we don't. But the way this thing's going, who the heck knows? So that's the uh, the roster move situation there. Uh, let's talk now. Let's see Mike Tomlin and the injury situation, health of the team right now. Uh, Isaac Samalu has a real shot to play against the Cowboys on Sunday night, according to Mike Tomlin. So despite all the negative injury news, especially with that offensive line that, again, has been just hammered by injuries and players being out for the season. One piece of good news is Samalu. We'll see what the uh, Wednesday practice report says. My guess is he'll have a good chance to be a full participant. But either way, good odds he'll play this weekend. Yeah, uh, I, I and and what a great time to get him back. Un- unfortunate on the heels of the James Daniels situation there, but uh, they need him back in this lineup, and hopefully that comes to uh, fruition. What about the rest of the dinged up players? 
Yeah, uh, let's see what we have here. Basically, Tomlin ruling out Alex Highsmith. He did the same with James Daniels, but we knew IR was coming for him, and and uh, those words happened before the official move to IR was announced. Basically, leaving a couple of players questionable and practice participation being the guide for Jalen Warren with his knee injury, Michael Prude with his knee injury, and Cordero Patterson with the ankle injury suffered in the first half of that Colts loss. Tomlin noted that a couple of Badgers, uh, Nick Herbig and Keanu Benton, will likely be limited early in the week, but should play against the Cowboys. And a little different posture and language used for Russell Wilson, who said he's been progressing and ramping up his work and uh, did more, would do more on this Tuesday, yesterday, compared to a week ago. Um, Still didn't really offer any guarantees about his health and situation, but essentially saying that he's getting close back to full health. Uh, and I guess the big, shall we cover what all Mike Tomlin had to say about the the, uh, the quarterbacks and Russell Wilson with, with Russ, uh, he said, uh, probably going to get some live pocket action this week. So maybe he'll, I, I, you know, maybe he'll get some 11 on 11 uh, type stuff there to see how he moves around in that former, you know, form and fashion and then kind of go from there. Uh did you just take it as just kind of repackaged, you know, previous week's comments here when it comes to Russell Wilson, other than just basically saying, yeah, he's closer. We'll see how much closer he is. Uh, and do you get a sense that there is a legitimate chance that Russell Wilson ends up as the backup Sunday night to Justin Fields? Yeah, I mean, I think overall Tomlin's commentary was similar, but it was for the first time different in terms of how he talked about Wilson in the quarterback situation at large. I mean, I think we're getting to a point where you might see Wilson be a full participant in a practice at some point. I don't want to guarantee that's going to be today. He's been limited every single day since aggravating that calf injury that Thursday before week one. When you talk about a live pocket, you talk about 11 on 11 then you're talking about you know potential full levels of participation, which would then start leading you to okay, he's he's you know cleared and healthy and you know 100 percent in terms of how he's practicing. I thought it was more interesting again from a Tomlin perspective, not from a, an outside perspective. Read the writing on the wall, but for the first time, Tomlin acknowledged the possibility of Fields remaining the starter even when Wilson is considered fully clear. Now, Tomlin still couched it as we're not at that point yet. We're not even thinking about that yet. But for the first time, Tomlin actually acknowledged that door was open. Yeah, he was asked uh, in so many words on if Justin Fields' performance in any way allows him to be more calculated or cautious about when or how they bring Russell Wilson back from injury. He says it potentially could, but it has not to this point. The guiding factor for us uh, in this point is the amount of, of ball that we have in front of us, how early we're in this process. Uh, that's probably been one of the significant variables in terms of our approach to this rehabilitation. He was then asked on if the in, uh, no, where was the other part uh, in here uh, where he was asked about kind of leaving the door open uh do you have it up there yeah i'm trying to find right now just maybe need a second here um i gotta find the exact oh he was uh, uh no that that was that i, I got it i, I got it He's, the transcript uh the question being summed up as on if uh justin fields play is getting to a point where the health of russell wilson is immaterial and tomlin's answer was quote there's a potential for that but we're not there as i stand here today and then somebody asks, what does Fields have to do to keep the job? Tomlin says, "Call cool, play well, win. That's our business. But the key phrase is there's a potential for that. Again, to every fan and every analyst, it, it, it seems like Fields is going to remain the starter, um, barring something dramatic happening, say, against Dallas. But for, that's, the, that's the first time I've heard Tomlin publicly talk about Fields remaining the starter, even with the healthy Russell Wilson. Yeah, he used potential twice, right? Or potentially and potential. Potentially in one answer and potential in the other. Look, he's no dummy. He knows we're going to parse all this stuff. Everybody's going to parse all this stuff out. But you're right. Uh, you know, he's been careful to kind of at first kind of leave the leave the door ajar, if you will, throughout this uh, with the whole 
rolling back to pole position and thing, you know, uh, throughout the uh, summer and all like that. Uh, but it seems like he's cracking, making sure to crack the door a little bit wider and a little bit wider as he goes along here. The main takeaway here, and I think you agree on this, is barring something amazing happening once again or out of the ordinary happening, uh, we expect Justin Fields to be the starter on Sunday night against the Dallas Cowboys. And I guess the thing to watch uh, is... Uh, Russell Wilson on the injury report, the level of participation in practice. And when we do get to Sunday night, uh, if uh, Russell Wilson winds up being the backup to Justin Fields or the inactive number three, uh, as has been the case through the first first four games. Now, uh, if we get to Sunday night and Russell Wilson is the backup, then his next press conference is going to be the really fun one uh, at, 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 at that point because then everything will have come to a head because obviously at that point, Russell Wilson has been act, uh, has been been is healthy enough to essentially get in games uh, and, and not serve as a, a you know, emergency option, if you will. Yeah, this week in terms of Wilson's status feels different than the others in terms of Tomlin's language and what ultimately could transpire on the injury report there's still a possibility that they end up you know having Wilson be the emergency third string quarterback inactive but if so this really feels like the last week you can kind of quote unquote get away with that and hide behind the injury I know calf injuries linger I know he's 35 but we're you know almost five weeks uh you know since he got he aggravated that calf injury so those things eventually heal. It was never that severe to begin with. He's practiced in some capacity every day since the injury. He only missed, you know, basically two weeks of practice in training camp when he first hurt his calf injury. So we're more than double that timeline now. So I, I don't know if ultimately we'll get to a point where Wilson is the number two, you know, true backup for this Cowboys game. But we're getting close to the point where Tomlin can no longer just play the health card the whole way through. Is it malpractice to try to hide from uh, where I'm getting with this is the questions aside, the speculation aside, the fallout aside, if Russell Wilson does what you want him to do in practice this week and you like it, he has to be the number two this week, right? I I don't want to say that quite yet. I think the team... Because you understand, what I, comes I know with that. I know he leaves himself open with the whole uh, part of the plan and bringing them back slow and a lot of games ahead of us and yada yada. But if he is the health, if he is in your eye in practice this week, the guy that best gives you the chance as a number two quarterback, God forbid, for, forbid you need it, then in my opinion, he should be the number two behind Justin Fields Sunday night. And then you deal with the fallout from, you know, the talking, you know, the questions that you're going to get either after the game or on next Tuesday. Yeah, no, I get that. I mean, I I understand the principle that you're making, but I, the calculation may not be that because obviously you understand if you make him the number two, then you've officially, well, you've unofficially said that, Wilson has now been benched and Fields is the starter that, that Wilson is healthy to play. Now you can still try to play it off and say, oh, the reps weren't quite there and he still missed time. Fields has gotten the one's work and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, I could still see Wilson spend one more week in his normal posture as a number three emergency quarterback. Sure, I, I could as well too. And that might be the way it ends up uh, being. But uh, look... All I'm trying to say is if he shows you enough to be the number two this week, then he should be the number two. Yeah, again, I get that. But this is not a normal, if he's healthy, he's the backup. There's a lot of implications to come along with that the team will have to to consider, I think, as well. All right. Uh, what else from Mike Tomlin here in this uh, press conference? Um, obviously, the health of the team was the big thing. I don't know if there was any other commentary that was really all that earth-shattering, but I'll have to go back through the transcript. What stuck out to you, Dave? 
Uh, he, uh, he, he didn't like the Devonte Adams call <laughs> and, nor, and it sounds like, uh, New York agreed with him. New York being obviously the, you said uh, Devontae yeah. Adams, you meant the, uh, Mika I mean, uh, Mika call, Fitzpatrick. Okay, I, I got, gotcha. I got, uh, Devontae on, on Adams. Brains. I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I'm looking at Twitter here. Uh, big mistake. Uh, he did not like the Mika Fitzpatrick, uh, pass interference call and New York uh, agreed with him. So, uh, with that. I'll be shocked if uh, Minka is fined come Saturday. Stranger things have happened, though. But uh, he did say that does not help us on a Monday or Tuesday, you know, as, as they sit here today. But uh, I think everybody at this point listening to this uh, would agree that that call on Minka was bogus. And it really wasn't in to hear uh, who was the uh, rules official. Uh, Gene Steratore. Uh, yeah, Gene Steratore said on DVE that, you know, severely impacted the game, which it, it, it really indeed did. So, uh, it's a shame, but at least we know where Tomlin stands and where New York stands on that. So not much more analysis to go from there. Uh, his assessment on Mason McCormick getting his first start and the play of, uh, Spencer Anderson, uh, in that game against the Colts double thumbs up on both guys. Maybe we'll get double thumbs up from some listeners today. Uh, Alex, uh, uh, we'll see, but double thumbs up on both guys. But again, I'm not surprised by it. Both guys have shown maturity beyond their years in this developmental process and play to boot. And thankfully I expect that to continue. Uh, he was later asked kind of specifically with Sayamalo expected back this week, uh, if he is considering rotating uh, McCormick and Anderson at the right guard spot. So he was kind of specifically asked within that question. I think Dulac answered it about right guard spot. And, you know, Mike Thomas didn't come right out and say it, but, you know, there isn't, we could see it go either way. Uh, they will let practice determine that this week of how they divvy up the opportunities and the reps and they are not, uh, he is not, uh, above just letting one guy, uh, be the guy. Uh, so with him not correcting the, uh, uh kind of specific, I like the way do like phrase that because he, he tried to pin him down to right guard, but Mike Thomas mm -hmm. did not correct him. Uh, are we to assume then, which is dangerous to do, that Sayamala will be at left guard and then one of, if not both, uh, McCormick and Anderson uh, are the right guard options. That is my working assumption until being told otherwise from a practice report standpoint. I think you made a good case to move Sayamalu over, but I'll assume he'll just reinsert himself in at left guard. That's where he's been since being signed by Pittsburgh. It'll be interesting, though, assuming that, say, Malu does stay at left guard. At right guard, you have McCormick, who they were obviously picking McCormick over Anderson coming into this game at left guard. But what happens at right guard? Anderson says he's more comfortable at right guard, and that's where he's played more in Pittsburgh than left guard. Uh, McCormick has been a left guard throughout his virtually his entire college career and in Pittsburgh. But he's the guy they were liking a bit more because he's more physical, a better run blocker. So is he comfortable enough to play at right guard? Um, that kind of makes the situation a real jump ball. Does it matter where these guys think that they want to play or are more comfortable to play other than Dan Moore <laughs> <laughs> in Pittsburgh? No, it doesn't matter, I guess, but you know, it will be interesting to try to do that on the fly. Uh, I, I overthink this stuff way too much at times, but, uh, um, uh, look, I, I thought both, uh, overall, when looking at the tape of both, uh, McCormick and Anderson, I thought they represented themselves well in this game overall, largely. I think, uh, obviously, and we'll, we'll, I think we'll get into this when we talk about the all 22, unfortunately for Najee Harris on, on, on design run plays for him. I didn't think the line blocked overly well. I thought they blocked better when Cordero Patterson, uh, was in the game, uh, from a pass protection standpoint. Uh, I thought it was, you know, it was good enough. And obviously with Fields ability to move out of the pocket and being able to make some plays out of the pocket. And then, you know, obviously some, de de you know, design rollouts and stuff like that. Uh, I forgot to look at how many true 
true pass sets there were uh, in this game. But uh, long story short, with the, with the configuration of whatever configuration this line ends up being come Sunday night, uh, you know, left to right, they they have enough talent uh, on that line to move forward with. As unfortunate as it has been, obviously with the injuries, there is enough talent to get done what they probably want to get done offensively. And I know uh, it's easy to sit here at this point and say, man, this, this line has been ravaged by injuries, which it has. But this team also went out of their way to draft you know, three offensive linemen, obviously one of them injured right now. And obviously you lose your top guy, uh, in, in, in James Daniels. And we haven't seen Sam Malo yet, but we know what he can do. I, I guess where I'm getting at here is it could be worse, uh, with, with where this offensive line sits, uh, heading into week five. And I think Ra- um, Ross McCorkle pointed out on Twitter yesterday, they have not started the same configuration mm-hmm. of, of an offensive line through the first four games. And it's starting to feel like what year was it? 2000 and I don't know, 14, 16 or something where they had all those different through the first, like, I don't know, what was it? 12 games had 10 different starting offensive line combinations. I forget the specific year uh, within that, but, you know, you had Ligurski moving all over the place and I forget who else and all, but uh, at least on the surface from what I saw coming out of the Colts game and, and where these guys are right now, it, it feels like it could be worse where they, where they sit now. Yeah. You see the investments in, investing in the offensive line pay off and this team you, know, you kind of wondered in the draft man you take three offensive linemen that, that seems really heavy but depth is so critical a few teams have it and it can be tested immediately and it has in pittsburgh this year so they're in a better place than most teams to handle all the injuries they've handled essentially three you know at one point or another starting players on injured reserve and herbig who open up the summer as the starting center. Now you can handle that one a lot better because you just went to Frazier and he's played really good football. But then Fautanu and James Daniels, some of your your best and highest on offensive linemen from the organizational standpoint. I, I think the issue is a little less about is there enough talent, but A, is the talent playing up to their level of expectations? In the case of Broderick Jones, I would say no. And then just, you know, two, the, the lack of continuity and an offensive line has to be a unit, not just right. are you talented individually? Can you play collectively and grow together? And obviously injuries and inexperience and guys shuffling around has really curtailed that. So to me, that is kind of where the concern comes in at uh, less about one for one is their talent, but can you come together and how long will it take for continuity? And oh, yeah, what more injuries could be down the road because we're only heading into week five. You see uh, Mason McCormick dodge a bullet in that game with that uh, clip that I posted on 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 one of those plays where he got his feet taken out from underneath him. Man, there were a lot of almost. I think on the same play, I think Dan Moore got his ankle twisted and he was down for a second. There was one where Broderick Jones got his ankle turned and he was down for a second. So yeah, there were a couple of almost on top of the actual ones. And that Daniel's injury was such a freak thing. Just step. You yeah. didn't even you just stepped wrong, and that just happens sometimes. And you see him go down, and that just sucks so much. I didn't zoom it, but somebody replied to that clip that I posted of that injury, thinking that maybe the, his heel or something got caught, caught in that carpet uh, when it, when he when he dropped back and all. But regardless of how it happened, it happened, and uh, yeah, they just it see <laughs> they they. They could have been down two other offensive linemen in this game. It feels like when you find two, uh, the uh, the tape and all like that. All right, so we'll see how the offensive line shakes out the uh, the rest of the week. There, Mike Tomlin was also asked on the possibility of getting some of the players uh, on 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 IRPUP uh, back in practice this week. He says I hadn't had those meetings yet, but probably. And so there's a level of excitement there. We'll see what their participation looks like and the quality of that participation and harden that up as we get closer to game time. So with today being uh, Wednesday, uh, we will have to see. Uh, well, Dave, we, oh, we have some here news. We go. That's the news on that uh, Pittsburgh announcing a pair of moves to fill those spots in the 53 
They have signed running back Aaron Champlin to the 53 off their practice squad and opened the window to return for outside linebacker Jeremiah Moon, who had an injury, which I don't think we ever knew the exact nature of in training camp, placed on IR uh, before uh, the season began, basically on cutdown date. Designated to return along with Dylan Cook, the offensive tackle. No, no news on Cook right now about his window opening up, but it has for Moon. And so uh, I think maybe the intent will be to sign Moon to the 53 later this week. Have to obviously see his conditioning and health and all that kind of stuff in practice. Uh, but Champlin to the 53, that'll fill one spot, and Moon could potentially fill the other. All right. Uh, amazing how that lined up with our conversation today. And luckily it didn't come in five minutes after we were done with the podcast there. So uh, I think the more notable thing there is that one Dylan cook is not having his window opened up today. So, uh, probably going to be a little bit more time on him, but it does. Uh, are you surprised Champlin and not Jonathan Ward? We've talked a lot about Jonathan Ward. Yeah, well, I think, A, what it speaks to is the concern over the health of the running back room as it currently stands with Warren's knee and and Patterson's ankle, which probably indicates that I uh, wouldn't expect both of those guys to play in this one. And there could be maybe some some longer term concerns because Champlin had an eleva- had two elevations left under his belt. My, my thought was coming to this game was just war for special teams. What I think ended up happening was because you saw Champlin play on a lot of third downs and he's a bigger, stockier body and probably better suited for pass protection than what Ward is. who's a little bit smaller. And so I think that's why Champlin got the nod and Champlin can play a bit on special teams as well. So that was his first NFL game against the uh, Colts and his, his first snap was split pick up on third down. So welcome to the NFL Aaron Champlin, but I think uh, they wanted somebody a bit sturdier in there to kind of handle because, you know, Warren was a third down guy and him not being out there. They were looking for somebody to handle some some pass pro work. All right. So one spot on the 53 man roster now open and we'll watch to see on Saturday what happens with Jeremiah Moon. And with Champlin being signed off, that opened up the practice squad spot for Winman. So that's your corresponding move from uh-huh. the practice squad aspect there you were asking about. So having fun with roster procedures. With All, Dave right. And Alex. All right. Uh, what else from Mike Tomlin there? We were just hitting the part about players coming back. So that's covered now. Uh, what else stuck out to you, if anything? Talked about the snap issues. The team acknowledges the concern. It won't change their approach. I, I thought... I thought Ben on his podcast had some interesting commentary you know, talking about repping it, but not just repping it, but also carrying out, you know, the, the the handoff, for example, whatever the play would be, not just literal. Okay, you're under center, take the snap, flip the ball back, do it again a bunch of times. Because uh, I think some, honestly, sometimes the issues are not just the actual snapping and exchange of the football, but the initial steps and footwork that are kind of the extension of the snap. How does the center move? How does the quarterback move? What are those steps they have to be? Uh, you know, synced up to, especially in this more zone heavy system. So I, I think Ben talked about kind of working on what happens immediately after the snap and your footwork that corresponds with it, helping um, from the under under uh, center stuff, obviously not going to impact the unexpected snap issues out of shotgun. Going back and looking at that play, Dave, on the L22, again, it's, it's hard to tell not being in that in that room, but what do you think? Any additional insight on what went wrong on that play? Uh, uh, the, the stepped on one? No, no, I'm sorry. The uh, the last one on the final drive uh, out of shotgun, the unexpected. Uh, I, I, I still contend it's it's kind of how we kind of broke it down there. I, I think that uh, it was the first leg kick. Uh, McCormick tapped Frazier. Frazier was still in the middle of line calls. And... When he got around to snapping it, Fields was, as he had said, taking a was trying to take one final peek at at what was happening uh, in the in the secondary, and he just was not ready for it, and probably figured that uh, maybe Frazier did not get the word yet or something because McCormick's turning, or even McCormick's turning back around right. uh, and saying, "Did I did did I miss something?" You know, almost to say, "Are are we are we all on the same page here?" You know, so I, I think two of them, I just think the whole timing of the thing just went south there. Yeah. I mean, th- that was the interesting thing is that you see McCormick on the snap when Frazier does snap it and Fields is not expecting it. And you're seeing McCormick look back. So how was that 
was that ball, should that ball have been snapped? Because McCormick's looking back. There's no way that ball should be snapped. I don't know what he was looking back for, for another signal, or if he was generally looking to see, are we snapping this thing or not? I I, I don't know, but there's or no may, way that Or ball... maybe it wasn't. Maybe, maybe it got miscommunicated what leg kick it was. Yeah, you know? I think there might have been a little bit more to it than what Fields had said, because you see McCormick look back, tap Frazier. Usually the ball snapped right away. It wasn't. And then McCormick's looking back at his quarterback when Frazier snaps it. And that obviously can't happen. I and mean, that's not how you, how you teach it, obviously. So uh, it, it's hard to really parse exactly what went wrong, but there was probably a bit more going on than exactly what uh, Fields had to say. It was too busy for sure. Uh, too much. Uh, the fact that we're having to spend, you know, to, to, to uh, go through this as many times as we've had to go through it already, you know, dating back to the preseason, all, all that stuff should be cleaned up by by week four of the season you know mm-hmm. uh for starters uh back to your uh, your your play action and your carrying out stuff and all like that uh ask peyton manning what he thinks about that uh kind of stuff that you know if you ever watch any of the what were those uh espn uh uh Omaha Productions yeah I, I forget the name of the show I know what you're talking man, about man you can't go through any segment, you know, uh, anything quarterback related with Peyton Manning talking about breaking down quarterbacks, uh, uh, without him talking about how important it is to, uh, work on, uh, play action stuff and carrying it out and getting that stuff down to a fine tooth comb where it all looks the same. He has always been, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 someone that that's been behind mastering those tiny details of the quarterback position. Now I think Peyton Manning's too busy to come in and, and work with, with some of these guys, but you know, along those lines, uh, that's something for Ard, you know, I think to really start working on is, is the finer details such as that. Cause this team needs help and play action period. Yeah, I wrote an article today examining that some of the numbers play action has been really ineffective for them uh, compared to non play action field is much better without using play action from a stat standpoint than he is with play action and with play action their yards per attempt is like 5.3 their first down success rate is low the quarterback rate is 20 points lower than non play action and there's a variety of reasons for that I think the two that I really came down to was you it, off play action so often you get high hat from the O-line with signals pass protection, with signals to the defense to throw in the football, don't take the cheese on the run fake and, and get depth and drop back into coverage. And so they need to have lower hat to really sell play action. And then two, I think the fakes have been poor. I had a cut up of, of some of the fakes and some of the, you know, attempted fake handoffs to the back from fields and they're not fooling anybody. They're half hearted. They're not even close to, to the mesh point on the running back. And so no one's going to be fooled by that kind of stuff. So you combine high hat with some half-hearted fakes. It's no wonder play action has been really ineffective. Not that it matters here, but overall, overall, but going back to our Wilson as the backup, potential backup uh, this week, Jerry Dulac says in his chat that I don't know for sure right now which role uh, Wilson will assume Sunday, but I'm going to imagine if he is a full participant in practice, he will be the backup against the Cowboys and not the emergency third quarterback. So, but once again, that all stems from, it's it's more, it's not reporting as much as it is speculatory. And uh, he does add in there that if he is a full participant in practice, so we'll have to see. You think you think Russell Wilson will be listed as limited today, Wednesday? Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you the same. Obviously, they're trending in a direction where I think you're getting close to full. My prediction, and I'm just just guessing here. Obviously, we're all just guessing. Um, even Dulac, I will say he'll be limited today, but at some point this week, Thursday or Friday, he'll get in a full. He'll, he'll get in at least one full days of practice this week. Um, that's my prediction. I will, I will guess he's limited today. If he is listed as full on Thursday and Friday, what, what would that tell you? Not enough. Yeah. Again, this thing could go either way. You just know the implications of having Wilson as number two. Um, I, I could see it where the team does something like he's limited Wednesday, Thursday, full Friday, but still emergency third quarterback and active for game day. And they just say, ah, oh, the reps just weren't quite there for us and decided to go with uh, 
Kyle and, and stay status quo there. I, I, I could see that, but I'll just, just kind of see what today's report is and go from there. All right. Uh, what else uh, did Mike Tomlin have to say? He said uh, Cordell Patterson was playing extremely well, but we're not surprised by that. He's a dynamic guy. We're excited about continually including him in what we do. We'll have to see how the injury report shakes out, obviously, with him this week. Uh, what else? It was really the bulk of it overall. I think we kind of touched on um, – all the big things he you know, talked about the history of the Cowboys Steelers rivalry and the chance to play them in primetime football. You know, it's the only the second primetime game ever between the Cowboys and the Steelers in the regular season. Last time was 1982. That, that, that surprised me. Well, for starters, they don't, you know, because of the rotating schedule, sure. you know, they haven't matched up a lot, but you know, we, anytime you talk about Steelers Cowboys, uh, especially history related to the game, uh, it's, you know, it's something both sides, uh, uh, fan bases gear up for, and it's an appealing matchup because of the historical nature of both franchises and obviously facing each other in the Super Bowls, uh, all those times on top of it. So yeah, at, at its core, even though they're only, you know, had the chance to meet X amount of times over the, over the course of the last however, however many years, uh, it is surprising that it's the first, first one in that long prime time. Yeah, I mean, I know they only play each other so often, but we're talking a forty-plus year time span. Last time they even played on on a, on a primetime game, so the ratings will be fantastic for this game Sunday night. Definitely. All right, Dave. I think we talked Tomlin enough. Let's talk Devonte Adams. He is in the news, front and center, starting yesterday. Um, friend of the show. Uh, um, oh God, I'm, I'm missing the name. Uh, bon Signor from from the Athletic uh, talked about and kind of his first report potential. For the Raiders to explore trading Devontae Adams. Then an hour or two later, after that Vinny Bond signal report, we got reward from Ian Rappaport that Devontae Adams had requested a trade and once out of uh, Las Vegas. And so those rumors have been swirling for months and the Raiders and even Adams had pushed back upon that and said he was happy. But now he wants out of Las Vegas, which opens up the door for Pittsburgh to be discussed as a potential trade partner, given their wide receiver need. So a lot going on here that'll dominate the conversation until there's a resolution with Devontae Adams. Other teams like the Jets and Saints are expected to be involved. What say you, Dave? Uh, and I and Josina Anderson uh uh reported Wednesday morning that you know at least there are, there is some preliminary investigation between the Steelers and the Raiders when it comes to him. Uh if we are to believe which there's no reason not to that the Steelers were heavily involved in pursuing Brandon Ayuk. I think everybody listening at this point uh would say yes the Steelers had more than just passing interest in going after Brandon Ayuk and obviously you know that 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 didn't come to fruition. Uh and then you look at the wide receiver position of this team and and the need still in that room. Uh, you look at a guy like Devontae Adams and his uh, background and, and even at his age, what he can provide a team. There is no reason to think that the Steelers won't highly, won't, won't, you know, won't, they're, they're going to be involved in, in, in trying to trade for him, I think. Now, whether or not they get it done, uh, will is yet to be seen. I do think though, and it's easy dot connecting for a team like the Jets and the Saints because of the, their quarterbacks, Aaron Rodgers and 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 uh, uh, David Carr, uh, that uh, or Derek Carr, <laughs> uh, get my cars mixed up there. Uh, be, because of those, you know, the, the relationship Adams has had with both those quarterbacks, it's easy to con to to con connect the dots about the Jets and the Saints you know, potentially being involved in looking mm -hmm. to trade for Devontae Adams. Uh, you get past the Jets, you get past the Saints. How many more teams are really going to be in play not named the Steelers here? For first and foremost, with what Devontae Adams has left on uh, salary uh, this year, it's not overbearing for teams to have to accommodate that 
although it would be challenging for a few teams. I think the Jets and the Saints are in, you know, could, could obviously make that happen. Uh, the list the list is going to be short overall. A, because teams, you know, especially if this waits until past week five, you know, the several teams are just going to be not, you know, not in a uh, position in the standings to, to, to make such a move. I wouldn't think, uh, could, is it plausible from a trade standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from a cap standpoint, is it plausible for the Steelers to land uh, Devontae Adams? The an- the short answer to that question is yes. And I've written two posts about this since yesterday afternoon. Uh, if now there's also the report of what supposedly the Raiders are asking for, like a number two and maybe something else is what the Raiders are, are, are seemingly uh, aiming for here. The only way that they're going to get high compensation for a guy like Devontae Adams is if they allow a team looking to acquire him to have contract talks with him about getting the final two years uh, of his deal, 2025 and 2026 re- renegotiated there. Because otherwise, you're j- if you can't work out uh, uh, getting those final two years uh, lowered and, and more respectable, then you are looking at Devontae Adams as a half a year rental. And if a team's looking at Devontae Adams as a half a year rental, there's no way they're going to come off like a second round pick uh, mm-hmm. to, to, uh, to get that done. Uh, there, uh, there will be several teams involved in this. I expect the Steelers to be one of those teams, uh, when it comes to that and look, dating back, I did a lot of research this, uh, uh, back when, you know, Devante signed the contract that he's on right now, back in 2022, when you look at those final two, uh, seasons of, of base salary, specifically 35.64 million and 36.64 million. Those are astronomical, even for you know a player of his caliber and, and position, position specifically. Those two base salaries were put into the deal pretty much with the understanding that he was not going to see those. Those were used to pad to get Devontae Adams' uh, uh, new money average uh, to twenty-eight million, where it currently sits right now. Nobody in their right mind, at least from my perspective, is going to trade for Devontae Adams with the intentions of paying him $35.64 million in 2025. Uh, just not going to happen here. So there's two ways to look at this. Uh, is a team, what, would the Raiders settle for trading him for a team that, that views him as a half a year rental because they can't work out something with him. And then thus the compensation would be lower. Uh, it feels like the Raiders would be just, I mean, I, I guess it could get to the point where you take what you can get at that mm-hmm. point, but it does not feel like that is the intentions right now with him, especially if they're looking to deal him further out from the trade deadline than they are closer to the deadline. So within that, uh, I would expect them to give permission to several teams to talk to Devontae Adams and his agent to try to work out a contract uh, uh, manipulation, if you will, redo, restructure, whatever, uh, so that to th- at the very least, 2025 becomes a lot more manageable uh, there. And I do think the Steelers could get in those sort of, of, of talks with Adams and his agent. And it's, 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 it's a lot more workable than, than I think people look, the talking heads are out here spewing. And this includes the Pittsburgh sports disc jockeys as well. They're, they're looking at, they're looking at the wrong numbers here. You know, they're looking at the number, A, I've seen a couple of them look at the cap numbers, which the cap numbers mean nothing because the proration is going to go away and the, the, the Raiders are going to have to eat that. You don't need to look at these base salaries for Devontae Adams in 2025 and 2026 as a determination of what will happen here. The, the, the devil's going to be in the details of what you can get him to agree to uh, assuming you you trade for him, 
that's where this is. And it is very, very workable, especially, and even if, and this was my second post uh, that I wrote uh, late Tuesday night, Alex. And it's a, it's a dangerous assumption, but you have to start somewhere, okay? Mm-hmm. Let's assume Devontae wants to keep his new money average of $28 million intact here, okay? Uh, and then let's also assume that he wants at least a cash flow into his average cash flow through the last or, or, or from 2022 through 2024 comes out to 22 and a half million per year since he signed that deal. Okay. So even though his, his new money average is 28 million, his cash flow up until this point has been as averaged out or would have had averaged out to 22 and a half million through this year. If you were, to, and once again, these are dangerous assumptions, but you got to start somewhere when trying to break this down. If we are to assume he wants his new money average at 28 million to stay the same. And if we're to assume he wants his cash flow through the first two additional years of 2025 and 2026 to stay right around 22 and a half million, this can be done quite easily. Now it's done a lot more easily if the team that trades for him adds two more additional years, 2027 and 2028 onto his deal with the assumption that he does not play through those so that some inflated salaries can be put in there to still give him that $28 million new money average on top of still maintaining a cash flow in 2025 and 2026 of $22.5 million dollars in each of those years, it can be easily done and it can be easily done too, where you where either Devante or the team or both walk away from each other after the 2026 season so that there's not a lot of dead money involved here. This is a lot easier on paper to get done at even those numbers that I laid out than most people probably have put in the time and effort to look at here. So it can get done. It can get done specifically on Pittsburgh's end with the assumption that they would like to trade for Devontae Adams and have him at least through the 2026 season. Question. Do, do you think that would like be... like Mike Tomlin. <laughs> yeah, open up the questions. Do you think that would have to be done as condition to the trade happening basically be figured out at the time of trade or could that be done say after the season no you you get all that worked out before you trade for the time okay right. would that require a minka fitzpatrick restructure or would this you know restructure of adam's contract be able to avoid having to also restructure minka here's the thing and it seems there seems to be from Capologists, junior capologists, and and outsiders uh, who are smart with money. There seems to be a growing thing uh, idea in the NFL that just because a, a team say restructures a guy uh, with maybe one or two years left going into a season, that they are doing so with the idea of maybe increasing his trade value because the closer you get to the trade deadline, the lower that base salary is, is easier for other teams Mm -hmm. to accommodate before maybe they want to work out a deal with a guy uh, on top of it. And then, you know, uh, you're seeing more and more too. And I would, I, I kind of think this might be trending this in this direction uh, with the Raiders here is I would not be surprised, even though it's not a huge amount uh, left on Devontae Adams for 2024, as far as base salary goes, uh, a little more than, uh, you know, th- between 13 and 14 million. It would not be surprising for a team that's looking to trade for him to ask the Raiders to eat some of that. And they have the, cap space, right? Right. Uh, with the byproduct of that being 
a little bit higher comp- trade compensation on top of, top of it there. So all of this plays into one big giant puzzle piece here. Uh, look, the lower you can make Devonte Adams the remaining amount that he's owed in 2024, the lower you can make that amount, that that makes him more attractive to more teams mm-hmm. uh, to be able to at least accommodate that before reworking. The, those final two years. Second, it gives the team that's trading them away, in this case, the Raiders, uh, more ammunition to say, okay, we'll eat even you know a little bit of, of this base salary uh, as far as the cut co- the trade comp. We're asking higher trade compensation, though, because of that to accommodate teams in that aspect of it. Uh, so when and if Devontae Adams does get done. I do like the probability of the Raiders having to eat some of whatever's left uh, uh, of the 2024 salary. And that thing clicks every, every week that he stays with the Raiders moving forward from right now, that clicks down almost a million dollars. Okay. Right. right. Uh, so if they don't get it done this week, uh, what's owed to him moving forward is, almost a million dollars less here. So that's something else that plays into it. That would then in turn match the report that Adam Schefter said that, you know, they're looking for a second and probably something else on top of it. Now, look, I have been surprised a lot throughout the years thinking, oh, there's no way that team gets that. And then they end up getting that or close to it or in in few cases, even more. A second round pick for a, for Devonte Adams, still regardless of the 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 you know, what the Raiders might eat and all like that, still feels a little rich overall. But if you're going to trade him and expect at least a second and something else, mm-hmm. it does feel like you would have to eat some of the remaining 2024 salary. And plus, it's a given that you have to let teams talk to Devontae Adams to see what they can uh, work out for uh, with the final two years of his deal. Yeah, to do a second, it would have to be more than a rental and some favorable financial terms. Listen, I mean, he went for, what, a first and second round pick just two years ago, two and a half years ago. He's not going to command that now. Uh, uh, Obviously, at least I assume he won't. But, you know, as a second and maybe a fourth or something, a crazy thought. If there's a couple teams competing that drives up his his value a little bit, assuming that he's going to be expected to play longer than just 2024, maybe that's not a, a crazy thought for what his you know caliber of play can be. What's interesting is when the timing of this could be, because the initial report of the Raiders, seemingly the initial framing was the Raiders were kind of reaching out was, well, they're two and two. The deadline's not till week nine. It's pushed back an extra week this year. That's a proposal that Pittsburgh offered the NFL adopted, this thing may take a while to happen. Right now, if Adams wants out, maybe it happens at at any point. And he's going to, he has a hamstring issue. (laughs) Is it a real hamstring issue or is it I'm unhappy and I therefore have a hamstring issue is kind of what I'm wondering now. Yeah, we don't know the answer to that one, but it's an interesting uh, element within all of this, right? Is is that we could have a miracle healing here. Yeah, Uh, like Ayuk. Uh, put, 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 put the hands on him. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you don't know. Uh, and I, yeah, I think you're right. This could happen in five minutes from now. Now, look, it is Wednesday of the NFL season and teams are getting to work right now. Right. And you would think, uh, if a team is, is, is going to trade for Devonte Adams and then have him on the field for, 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 for Sunday or Monday, it would have to happen probably today. Yeah, uh, I don't think it's going to happen this week, and, but the point is it may not happen at the deadline time like these deals typically occur. This could really happen, I think, anytime, maybe starting next week. Or or we could be playing this for the next four, sure. uh, you know, four weeks or whatever it is until Absolutely. the trade deadline as well, too. Uh, and here's the, here's the other element as well, too, because teams are going to have to talk to Devontae Adams about his contract, uh, and I don't know, I, I don't has there been anything reported about no trade clause or anything? I don't think I don't think that's involved here. Maybe it is, but regardless, because he has the say about his contract in so many words, he does have say uh, essentially where he goes. 
Right. And the reporting is, as you mentioned, he not saying that they're, that they're the only two teams he would consider, but he would prefer and is high on the idea of going to the Jets or the Saints. Remember, he was traded from Green Bay to the Raiders in large part due to uh, Derek Carr and their relationship. They were teammates at Fresno State, two prolific players in college. And that was one of the reasons why he wanted to go to the Raiders. And then, of course, the Jets are obvious for the chance to reunite with Aaron Rodgers. And so uh, Pittsburgh could get frozen out in that sense, but they'll be in this thing. There'll be rumors and buzz. And, you know, I again, I, I've said all along that Pittsburgh should never close the door on looking for a receiver. This would come up even after the Ayuk saga ended. I don't think that closed the door on them looking for receiver help in total. They should. They should explore these opportunities for Adams and for whoever else comes up. I think it's clear they're lacking that number two and for this offense to be at its best for a Pittsburgh team, you presume will be competitive and in this race until the very end of the regular season. Um, you know, I think they have to look to, to at least consider those moves by that trade deadline, which again is after week nine. It is Tuesday, November 5th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. That is the official trade deadline. All right. Probably 70% of the people listening to our podcast don't like me getting deep into the numbers. The other 30% probably don't have no issue with it, but let's, let's boil it down uh, this way. A should the Steelers be involved in seriously looking to trade for uh, Devonte Adams? My answer is yes. Mine is yes as well. All right. Uh, should the Steelers ultimately trade for Devonte Adams and be the team that gets him. The way I envision this going down is, is they get the Raiders to eat uh, some of that remaining 2024 salary. And then we see them turn around and get his contract worked down in the in 2025 and 2026 uh, with the potential of adding on whether you want to call them void years or years that you know that he's not going to get uh, that would because in doing so, you could make Devante's 2024 cap ultra low uh, uh, within that. That would make the most sense. So if this and then on top of it, I would not expect the Steelers to give up more than a third round pick for him, assuming all those other variables come into line. Yeah, that all makes sense. I mean, I hadn't thought about exact compensation. I, I think that's that's about what it would take, I guess. I haven't looked, and I don't want to get in the weeds about too many hypotheticals, but not that a fourth-round pick would be the leading uh, compensation, I wouldn't think, but do they have a fourth-round pick they could even give? Because at this point, it's looking like Justin Fields, that conditional sixth-rounder is going to turn into a fourth-round pick in 2025, so I don't know at all they're going to have available uh, as potential trade compensation to the Raiders, but that's all probably a bit, bit down the road. I would. And, and I mentioned this right out of shoot. I, I do view the jets as probably the most likely landing place uh, uh, out of all this for, for the obvious reasons here. Uh, but I do think the Steelers should give it their all when it comes to this uh, because who knows whatever, what, you know, who knows for sure what other wide receiver, you know, there've been to talk about the DK Metcalf and all like that, but the Seahawks are, uh, seem to be in good shape right now. And Gino and DK have a, have a good connection going. Uh, you're only going to get X amount of shots between now and, and the trade deadline to, to add to that wide receiver room. And, uh, what do you think about the valuation, uh, over the cap has, on Devonte Adams, they have his current uh, valuation at sixteen point four eight three million. Is that too low? Uh, is is a new money out? The way I laid it out of a cash flow in twenty two uh, as twenty two and a half million for Devonte uh, uh, in two thousand twenty five and two thousand twenty six. Is that fair? Is that too high? Is leave is leaving his uh, new money average, however you got to do it with inflated salaries, in you know maybe uh, in, with two additional years, uh, is that fine to do? I mean, I hadn't sat down and studied it all, but it, it feels a little bit low across the board. A 16.8, what would that make him a top 20 paid receiver? And even 22 and a half is on the low end. I mean, I I, I don't know exactly what he's looking for. Obviously, the, the 2025 and 2026 salaries he's owed right now is, is far too high, but I don't know if he would want to do 22 and a half because that would make him, what, the 
I don't know, 13th highest paid receiver in football, something like that. Which yeah, feels- but I mean, uh, you you could do the cash flow at $22.5 million over the next two seasons and still form the contract where he has a new money average of $28 million. It's okay, just, yeah. it, it's just it's just bragging rights on the list. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, but I mean, it, it is what everybody goes off of. Sure. Sure. So yeah, I think maybe, I think your scenario that 22 and a half in terms of the, the cash flow, and then, you know, 28 kind of the appearance and what it gets listed as makes it look more, more likely to occur there. I mean, I imagine there's a way to get it done as you've laid out. There's some options, some avenues. It, it may come down to a, where he wants to go, I think, first of all, and then B just what trade compensation um, are you willing to part for whatever you know contractual solution you figure out? All right, we'll have to see how long this takes. Now it feels like he's going to go somewhere. <laughs> it does, um, but you know, heck, last year we we're talking about oh, Jalen Johnson is going to get traded from the Bears, and he's going somewhere, and he stayed. Now the situation, I don't think it's necessarily one to one. Apparently, there was something happened with Antonio Pierce where he liked the post about Adams playing his last snap, and that was you know obviously made. Uh, aware to Adams on that. So who knows what will happen there. But if you're the Raiders, you're sitting there saying, you know, we're two and two. We want to try to compete in this thing. We're not not really itching to get rid of this guy. We're trying to trying to win right now. Um, but if he wants out, then that's probably going to be the uh, eventual outcome. Yeah. And look, uh, they can take whatever posture that they want to. But uh, Devontae Adams is not going to see that salary as a member of the Raiders after this year. And it no. does not sound like they're going to be able to work out anything with him uh, beyond this year. So that means that to get the most that you can get for him, because uh, the other alternative is cutting him after the season, right? Uh, you would do something between now and the trade deadline. Yeah. And of course, the Raiders may want to keep him. But if the hamstring is still tight, or quote unquote tight, then he may not be playing until he gets traded and that hamstring suddenly starts perking up. So th- there really may not be a benefit to keeping him because he may not be really helpful to the Raiders efforts to win right now. The other side minor side story to this is who did the Steelers play in week six? The Las Vegas Raiders. And in Las Vegas at that. So mm-hmm. would they really seriously consider trading him uh, to the Steelers to turn around and have to face him uh, the following week? Maybe they don't maybe may, may, Maybe that's overblown. I don't know. But uh, I have a feeling we'll be talking about this for a few more shows, at least, unfortunately. Yeah, at least it won't be longer than November 5th, um, because that is the trade deadline. So at least there was a hard deadline for that to happen this year. The bad part is it is still more than one month away. All right. Moving on from Devontae Adams Depot. To Deontay Johnson Depot, just a quick note on this. We mentioned this during the Monday live stream, wrote about this because there have been a couple questions and, you know, you can debate if you like the idea, if it was likely or not, but it wasn't the craziest idea of, okay, you traded Deontay Johnson to the Panthers, the Panthers, you know, even with Andy Dalton you know, providing some juice to that offense, they're going to be sellers, they're not going to be contenders this year. Clearly, could you trade back for Deontay Johnson and get in for half a season for each and to be would be cheap to acquire not the craziest idea. You may hate it. That's fine on a personal level. I'm not advocating for it, but I understood the idea. Turns out you can't do that. And this was coming from uh, Ian Rappaport talking about Hassan Reddick with the Jets. Could he go back to the Eagles? Because that deal has been a disaster for New York, a contract impasse there. NFL rules prohibit players who have been traded to a team to be traded back for the next uh, following two seasons. And so that would uh, disallow Deontay Johnson to return to Pittsburgh. I make that point to, to a answer that question we've gotten a couple times about Deontay, but also I had no idea that was a rule. And so it's good to know for, for now and for the future. I did, uh, Yeah. And as much as I stay buried in the CBA and try to stay up on, on top of uh, uh, the rules and what, what you can and can't do uh, that, that w- if I knew it before I, f- I had forgotten it. Yeah. Now, if he were to hypothetically be released, then you could sign him back. I believe Um, this happened in a similar fashion with Josh Dobbs when Pittsburgh traded him to Jacksonville in 2019. And then Jags released him one year later and Pittsburgh claimed him off of waivers, but they couldn't hypothetically have traded back for Josh Dobbs. So uh, it's it's good to to talk about that now because it may come up at some point down the road. All right, Dave, let's talk all 22 from the Steelers-Colts game, and let's start here with this offense going back through the all 22. Any different thoughts, any different uh, takeaways from this loss? Uh, I think we should concentrate on the runs that Najee Harris had. What did you think about those? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a long discussion to be had. And obviously, he wasn't productive. And the, the kind of storyline top line is that Patterson had success on his runs. He averaged over seven yards per carry. Harris was 13 carries, 19 yards, really abysmal numbers. He talked about post game that just the holes weren't there. They were free hitters. And watching the tape, Dave, it's hard to disagree with that assessment. I mean, we could try to go through this run by run. I, I just, I, I didn't see... There was maybe one run where I thought he could have gotten more than what was there or what he ultimately got. But overall, this thing was bottled up pretty good on every carry that he had. I agree. I could not agree more. I'm surprised he had 19 yards looking at the tape, to be quite honest with you. Uh, there was the one I thought maybe we're talking about the same one. I can't remember the specific play, zone but run. Could have cut back maybe. Yeah, he got tackled. He was cu- trying to cut back left and got taken down off the, the right side. I don't know if that's the one you're talking about. I, I thought maybe he could have a quicker back would have hit that hole. Maybe, maybe. And even so, we're talking about, what, three, four, or five more yards? Yeah, probably wouldn't have been. We're not talking a, a 40-yard run there. Uh, I just did. I thought they were it, when Cordell Patterson, uh, his carries, I thought they were blocked up a lot better. He had a lot more opportunities to uh, to make some yardage there. So uh, I, I just I don't think the runs were blocked up very well, or, or the you know, and the calls against the uh, against the defenses in those situations, you know, weren't weren't conducive to him having a lot of yardage. They just weren't. Uh, I did go back and look at the uh, that third down. Uh, play that you said should they have challenged on. Yeah, I, I think it was close because the ball was almost to the 40, right? Uh, in that mm-hmm. particular uh, situation. It's still hard. You try to look at when when the knee was down and w- would it have been conclusive enough? Who knows with that stuff? But uh, would it have been probably worth challenging in that situation? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it probably would have. To me, the play that really sums up, you know, what, Patterson had blocked for him and what Harris got blocked for him is they ran crunch for both of those guys once with Patterson. It came first on that first play of that, you know, drive Long that drive. Pickens fumbled on. Yeah. When he started at the four yard line and it's blocked up beautifully, the Colts are fooled and it, I don't know exactly how many yards it was, eight, 10 yards for Patterson. They ran that later with Harris and it was, you know, horribly blocked and the Colts weren't fooled that time. He ran it again. Colts were expecting it. And, I think maybe he got back to the line of scrimmage. And so you look at those two, same exact concepts with Patterson. You had a giant hole to run through with Harris. It wasn't there. And this was not, oh, quicker back would have hit that hole, you know, on the Harris front. It just, it just wasn't there for him. There wasn't the movement that was created the first time. So to me, that was kind of emblematic of the day. I, I charted last night the the play calls, the run calls for each Harrison uh, Patterson. I know Patterson got hurt. So there's a smaller sample size there. They called six, you know, inside zone or split zones for for Harris, uh, three duos, and then a couple of crack toss, a true gap run, dart with a backside tackle, and then crunch on, on the one I referenced. With Patterson, they called duo three times, inside zone once, crunch once, and then kind of a short trap uh, once. So it felt like they were running more zone with Harris and more uh, gap and power with Patterson. So you do wonder, you know, are the play calls different for the different backs? I know the numbers have suggested that Harris has been a better zone runner than a gap runner, but I, I had a feeling running inside zone against the Colts was not going to be a good strategy in this game. And I think it's kind of borne out by uh, Harris's lack of production. All right. Well, that's good info uh, there. Uh, regardless, they have got to find ways to get this running game going earlier. And then if you improve your play action uh, techniques and uh, er- everything that go along with that, you can hopefully start building off of that to pushing the football down the field a little bit and and, and getting some second level throws in and all like that. But they, they've got to figure out a way uh, to start getting the running game going earlier than what they've done. Yeah. What did you think about Fields' play? I thought it was a touch worse watching the All-22. I thought in the second half there were some poor decisions and and some missed reads on on that one Um, inside of structure. I thought out of structure, he did a great job to keep his eyes down. Fields had a couple of, you know, downfield throws, one to Pickens, one to Fryermuth. I did think some of the in-structure stuff, he wasn't seeing things quite as well as I thought maybe watching it live. 
Uh, I thought there were a couple uh, on one of the sacks. I think he, I, I, at least on one of them, I thought he could have, I thought thought he had an opportunity to get rid of the football. Uh, he had an inaccurate throw to Najee over to the left side kind of early-ish in the game uh, that stuck out. Uh, it, it, he, he seemed to shy away from the more riskier kind kind of, uh, opportunities that he had. But in the, in the meantime, I thought some of the dump down, uh, decisions worked out okay for him. Uh, I tell you one, one play that really stuck out that I, I, I did not really look at ahead of us talking on Monday that I made sure to look at, especially la- late last night, uh, the third, the, the play right after the aborted fumble, uh, Alex, uh, where he av- avoids pressure and, and goes out to the left side and, and throws off a platform uh, that was deep down the field that was incomplete to pick ins. Uh, I feel like if he would have put that ball out there, more and lord knows he has the arm strength to do it i know it was off platform and all like that uh but he he has the ability to make a a longer throw than what he did the ball placement on that allowed it to be more contested and pickens really to kind of become more the defender on that one if you will whereas if he would have laid that ball out in other words my guy or no guy Mm -hmm. in that situation there I think there there might have been a chance to complete that, to be honest with you. Because there was no one over the top, right? Right, right, right. So you, yeah. did you did you look at that one specifically? Do you have it pulled up? I can pull it back up. I mean, I, I went through it. I, I think it's just emblematic of the chaos that was happening after uh, that that bot snap, and that's where a timeout at some point should have come in. I mean, one of those plays, either that, you know, right after the snap, or after you know Harris doesn't get out of bounds, or they don't, you know, he, he doesn't, the clock doesn't stop there. Um, there's got to be probably some calming that Tomlin has to do in that moment where things were just too chaotic and. Uh, probably guys not playing their best ball because of it. I'll try to pull up the play though uh, quickly. But, but that's where you separate the you know the sure. uh, the a- an average to an above average quarterback. I think in that situation. Now it's just one play, and yes, I take into account all of what you just said there. But uh, pull pull it up, and you tell me. I mean, because and he's not really pressure. He's on the move, but it's not mm-hmm. like he's, he's there's no pressure. No, nobody bearing down on him. I mean, he could even really have 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 a chance to kind of set his feet, maybe a little bit more than what, or at least change mm-hmm. his posture uh, within that and get. Uh, uh, at the very least, I think the throw should have given his given Pickens a, a a more of an opportunity to make the play on the football. There, uh, it just it. Uh, if and if you look, Pickens almost has to become the defender on that play. Yeah, it's. I think you're right. I think Fields could have set himself and thrown it over the top. You're trying to do a low line throw against a tall corner. Jalen Jones, that corner is a big guy. He's like six two with length um, out of Washington State. And so, you, if you throw that low, you're giving a, a long DB a chance to contest that. So, yeah, I think you, I think Fields would probably say he would like to have that throw back and to be able to put that ball in a better place. He threw a beautiful that might deep be ball a touchdown play. if we're being honest here. If, if you get that, because Lord knows we, Pickens has gotten some balls we that that that. He probably shouldn't have caught. Uh, and look, even I, I know Pickens kind of stutters at the top of that, right? Well, I think he's trying to slow down right. and for the ball that's lower than what he thought it was going to be. Right, because the ball's in the air at that point, right? Or, uh, so, but, but regardless, I think if you put that ball three to five yards further than what it is, if not even seven or eight, I, I, Pickens might go, go, can go get that. Yeah, I mean, he stutters because he's thinking the ball is going to go over the top of him, and then he realizes it's going to be short. He's trying to then come back and fight through the DB for it, and and you, you know, you could argue was there a penalty there? I don't know. I think it was fairly clean overall. Right. If I would have called that one, uh, given the, kind of the ball being being pretty short. So yeah, I mean that that's fair, and you want to see him hit that play. I get that. The play I was kind of referencing about like Fields just not necessarily reading things on on the one before his one rushing touchdown on the goal line on that right side where it was almost picked or, you you know, the corner's clouding, that throw's not there. Hayward ends up being open the back of the end zone and Fields kind of locks on Pickens there. They're kind of running this switch play where Pickens is number three and then he releases out wide to become the new, new number one and it's just not there and, and Fields kind of forced that one and nearly got picked because of it. So still, I mean, a gamer performance, you put points on the board, that deep ball to Pickens was a beautiful throw, the lowest completed. 
in the second half. I just thought maybe he wasn't reading things as consistently as I thought maybe he did when I was watching the game line. All right. Uh, and, you know, he made some uh, uh, out of structure plays to, to, as you mentioned, Pickens and Firemuth was another one. I, I thought he did good there. Uh, I tried to cur- go back through and critique it as, as, reasonable as possible here and there yeah there were a couple of times i thought maybe decision wise could have been better but the thing the thing really that stuck out the most to me uh was that uh late late throw down to pickens to be quite honest with you uh that that has a, a opportunity to really change the outcome of the game uh with 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 time running down in it my other thoughts in this game, I didn't think the receivers as a whole got much separation against man coverage. I thought they struggled to really get open, and that's why some of those plays became extended. Some of those throws became contested. I thought the route concepts were a little bit bunched up as well, and it wasn't as strongly called to help kind of scheme some guys open. But I just thought there wasn't a lot of separation across the board from really any of the Steelers wide receivers. There was one instance where you have Scotty Miller and Pat Frymuth right crossing right within a yard of each other. Yeah, it was that underneath. Uh, you're talking about, yeah. I think that was that play. Yeah. Um, so some of the, it, it just felt like a very sloppy game from an assignment standpoint. I had that collage of photos and you had the one about Edmonds and, and Beanie talking after the touchdown they gave up of like players visibly confused, like their hands are out pointing at people like what's going on. Like that was a running theme of this game, offense and defense of players just seemingly not sure what was going on. It felt very just this this game lacked detail from an assignment standpoint from this team. All right. Anything else on offense stick out? But what um, about what yeah. about some of his sacks? Have you had a chance to look? Well, yeah, on the twenty himself? yard uh, on that the, the disaster twenty yard play, there's two free rushers. I don't know why Harris wasn't directed to stay in. I'm not saying it's his fault, but whatever the protection was, he probably should be staying in there. But that ball's gotta be hot. And there's hot options. Harris could have been one. Uh Frymuth was turning around, Haywood was getting his, his head back. So um, I know Fields can utilize his legs against Denver. They got a big 16 yard run off of that, but like that ball has to be hot. That ball should be thrown out by Fields. So th- there shouldn't even been a sack in the first place, let alone the fumble, because that ball's got to be hot. I agree. Uh, the main takeaway, though, is Fields has done more than enough to keep the job right now, right? Yeah, to be clear, my stance hasn't changed. I think Fields should start against the Cowboys, and I'm not looking to immediately pivot back to, to Russ, but there was a little more negativity on tape than. Than what I thought, but there were still some some positive plays. The O line thought Jones was worse on all twenty two than I thought it was live. Uh, Dan Moore little consistent. McCormick, I think he was a little messy with the sets early, his on body sets. Um, I thought he got better as the game went on. Anderson looked a little bit better in pass pro than he had been. Um, Frazier was stout. Um, I thought McCormick did. You know, uh, some run game stuff probably need to work on pad level, getting a push. But I thought his sets looked comfortable. All right. Uh, he's going to be a guy, I think, for his career that's going to have false starts, too. Uh, didn't he have a problem with that in college? Did he? I know he had one in this game. Um, I think, I think particular- that was some of the talk that we had about him. Okay. I mean, uh, I wonder if there's a reason for that, if it just I think he just gets a little jumpy, I think. Okay. But, well, uh, you, had, you had the stat that with the ref this week for the Cowboys game, Sean Hockle, he's <laughs> calling a high rate of offensive penalties. So these guys better be buttoned yeah, up. Yeah, they better be buttoned up on offense because you're right. Uh, so far, he has called a lot of offensive uh, uh, penalties. Most in the league, right? Most, most yeah, penalties high, on highest, the offense. Highest percentage, yeah. Um, high defense. Patrick yeah, again, Queen could have played better. Yeah, that was a pretty poor game from Patrick Queen. Missed tackles, uh, miscommunication. I just thought, again, a sloppy defense overall. I, I'm still, I was surprised Tomlin didn't mention it. Uh, the, the, the weighty third downs, Pittsburgh a lot was a real story in this one. Um, again, he eight broke of 15. those down. Yeah, the eight of 15 on third down, six of 10 on third and six plus. Those were unacceptable numbers. I thought they were too easy to. Um, Flacco picked apart zone coverage. I, I thought, again, obvious based on the box score, but the Colts had the best game plan and best execution of that game plan for TJ Watt in terms of the zone read stuff early with Richardson before he got hurt, slowing him down. They ran some jet action to slow Watt down after that. Of course, they gave him attention with chips and slides and all that kind of stuff that every team does. Um, But they just had a really good game plan overall, especially on the backside of some of those runs to make sure that Watt was a general non-factor. Yeah, they did. uh, Every It's not like the plan you know, from, from team to team is going to change all that much. It's how you execute it. And uh, especially with some of the window dressing uh, within there, they gave, they gave Watt a lot to deal with and a lot to think about. 
Yeah, yeah. So I thought from a run game perspective, they handled Watt um, better because the challenge for those zone teams is you got Highsmith and Herbig and Watt from the backside that can charge in and really blow those plays up. The Falcons gave a good example of that. Uh, the Colts had some wrinkles to make sure that was less of an impact. With Patrick Queen, I think one of the most concerning things has been kind of the missed tackles, has it not? Yeah, I don't know exactly. I helped check um, Josh's missed tackle report and charting, but uh, it's been. I mean, it was bad in the opener. I thought it calmed down. I thought it was more of an issue in this Colts game. Uh, I, I agree, and there were all. Uh, he was bodied a couple of times by the, by a few of those big and and bigger, you know, Colts offensive linemen, interior offensive linemen. Uh, I mean, that's that's a good. They were without Ryan Kelly, but they they sure weren't 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 missing a, a beat with uh, Bordellini in there. Uh, the physicality and early on in this game, that interior just did not do a good job. Uh, we said we're going to talk a little bit about Nick Herbig and how he did specifically against the run. I, I thought for the most part he held his own pretty good, especially with knowing early on you have to deal with the with uh, with 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 the zone read that's going to keep you at home, and you know you're going to have to make sure that nobody gets outside of you and things like that. And look, he was going up against a uh, you know a, obviously a you know a pretty pretty decent tackle on that side with some size and all. Uh, did you feel it was an egregious performance against a run by him? No, I wouldn't say that. And I think certainly once Flacco came in, they were able to focus in on Taylor more. The zone read was a non-factor, and, and the whole run defense perked up across the board. Uh, no, from I think from a like strength standpoint, he was strong. I thought he showed power in this game more as a pass rusher. I mean, he had a great uh, speed bull rush on on Raymond uh, or Ryman, the left tackle, one time and, and ran him over. But even against the run, I didn't think he was getting pushed around too much. There was one play where he wrong armed the guard, and there was no outside help. I don't know if there was miscommunication there, but yeah, from a, like a strength standpoint, I, I thought Herbig was not overmatched or overwhelmed against the run, though. All right. Uh, when you talk about uh, not taking the football away at closer view of that first pass of the game, uh, I think it's less Joey Porter having a chance at intercepting it. Uh, I think it's more about that was great ball placement by Richardson because an inch lower, Joey Porter gets a hand on that. Lord knows where the ball goes if he is able to tip that up in the air. And another two inches higher, and that lands right in Minka Fitzpatrick's uh, uh, chest uh, for an interception there. So I don't, I, I come away thinking that was less turnover worthy than what I initially thought. Now, the one in the end zone for Joey Porter would have been a huge takeaway. If I, I bet nine times out of 10, he catches that football. Uh, and then obviously the football on the ground, the early Richardson fumble, you're only going to get so many times with, uh, with the money on the floor, right? Yeah. You got to capitalize there. Yeah. I mean, that first play, maybe it wasn't turnover worthy, but disrupt, you know, break, break that pass up and turn it into incompletion instead of a 32 yard gain. I thought Porter did well to find the ball in those moments because oh, yeah. he's playing zone and coming off of routes and they communicated well and like he he was able to undercut these routes, just can't finish, but finishing is what ultimately matters on the box score. So yeah, I thought Porter was seeing things well on those plays. Um I thought he got picked on otherwise, but but on those plays he saw it, just couldn't finish the play. Uh and I think this was our our, our takeaway coming out of the game on 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 Monday there. Uh that second set of four third downs what was was the killer yeah that 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 broke your back cuz you get a stop in in those moments then the whole game might have flipped i thought again just just lack of detail um we talked about one of those third downs a 25 yard or two josh downs pittsburgh's running a a, a four man pressure with queen blitzing i think herbig had dropped out and there's no contain the whole line slides down the right side flacco just rolls to his right and has you know it's his pitch and catch at that point benton I assume has to be contained there. He's he's swimming to the inside. He should not have a two way go. He's going to be able to contain on the outside and help keep Flacco in the pocket. Um, I, I thought rush lane integrity was an issue in this game in some regard, and I just thought overall Flacco had consistently clean pockets to work from. The ball came out quick, two point six seconds. It was his snap to throw time in this game, so pressure was hard to sustain. Um, but when you play zone coverage and Flacco reads that the ball is going to come out pretty quick, when the Colts play on schedule, when they're ahead, uh, all those factors. So the Colts just really were in control of this game. And on the final touchdown to uh, the tight end there, that looks like it was designed to be a, kind of a red Tampa 2 t 
type situation and Beanie didn't get the call. And I think he said as much after the game, you can, uh, and then Edmonds had a powwow with him, uh, right after the play in the middle of the field. Yeah. I mean, they were making a check, I think, as you see Porter also carry a route. And so I don't know if like Porter thought it was man two and there was miscommunication. It's hard to say, but yeah, I think at the very least supposed to be zone Beanie's supposed to pass that off and, uh, didn't in that left. Ogle tree wide open, which again, third and 10, 15 yard touchdown. Those things are killers. Right. Uh, and I'm trying to think of anything else kind of really stuck out to me. Uh, the tackling could have been a little bit better, specifically queen in this. Uh, they got to button that stuff up early in the game because they were getting kind of blown off the ball up front there uh, initially. Yeah, that Queen's got to take on blocks better. I, I know Dallas is not running the ball well. They're running really one of the worst running teams in football. But just watching through Dallas in my early tape study, the first thing I noticed about them is their offensive line is huge. Their offensive line has to be like an average weight of 330 pounds across the board. They are a big offensive line. So Queen's going to have to really be able to get off these blocks and, and work his hands better. thought Peyton Wilson had that issue early as well. He played more downhill, more physical throughout the game, which was good to see in those nickel packages. Um, but yeah, Queen, I want to want to see some more in terms of him playing the run, attacking a little bit harder, getting off blocks. All right. What anything did you uh, nitpick any more special team stuff? Um, no, not really. I usually do that last and and nothing's really come to mind uh, on that right now. All right. All right, Dave, I think it kind of covers things pretty well. Anything else you want to share? Feel free or we can get through some reader emails and close out today's show. All right, let's do it. Uh, Mike. Shirt, sir, right, San Dave and Alex, but this is a cap question. Uh, as always, love the show. I think you're easily the best info for Steeler specific cap info. So I have a question for you. Lots of ru new rumors about wide receivers we could trade for. How does trading for a player work cap wise for the team getting the player? Everything I search uh, for online talks about the team giving up the player. Uh, I assume we need enough cap space at the time of the trade to account for their current contract before a potential restructure. At least I think that was the case for the IUP trade, he says. But is that just the base salary we need space for, or do we have have uh, have to have room for the prorated salary based on games left, outstanding roster bonus? Uh, many of the guys uh, mentioned had 500K game bonuses. If that's the case, it looks like some of the floated trade options would need us to make some room to execute, or is it something totally different than that? Uh, Mike, you've got the, the right basis here. Uh, teams do not, though, have to account for whatever you know, the prorated bonus, the team uh, that he's coming from, from uh, you have to be able to accommodate whatever the remaining say base salary is, or let's take it, for example, the situation with uh, Devonte Adams, because he has uh, $510,000 in total per game roster bonuses uh, that he can earn. Now, obviously that clicks down just like his base salary clicks down per game because the Raiders have to pay him for every week that he's obviously on the roster there. So that, so the, the amount that you're having to accommodate is whatever is left over to be paid on the base salary, plus whatever the prorated amount is on the per game uh, roster bonuses. You have to be able to uh, at least accommodate that from a cap standpoint before redoing the contract uh, with him. Now, once again, I would imagine if the Steelers wind up trading for Devontae Adams, they're going to have the Raiders probably they're going to ask for them to try to eat some of that remaining uh, 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 base salary of his. Uh, I have not, still not gotten around to balancing uh, off of the uh, updated NFLPA uh, public salary cap sheet and all. But according to them, the Steelers have a little more than $8 million in available salary cap space. So, at its core right now, they would have to do something like a restructure on Minka or something to create cap space to accommodate what would be Devontae Adams' full amount as we sit here right now today. But once again, they could ask the Raiders to eat, say, 
five, six million uh, of that and then still be able to, the Steelers would be able to accommodate what's left of that and then rework the deal from there. I would imagine that might be the way they, they would go. Uh, nothing says, though, that they can't restructure Minka. I just have a feeling that they would like to try to stay away from doing that if they could uh, overall. But I think the rest of it you have you know, uh, uh, kind of right here. They would have to accommodate whatever is left over uh, initially uh, minus the prorated, you know, signing bonus amounts before redoing a deal with a guy uh, if they were to trade for him. So good That's question. exactly what I was going to say. So I, I know. <laughs> now, thank I, you for explaining that. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm a glory hog. So I, I took the question instead of uh, <laughs> Alex there. Uh, Andrew Gallus writes in, Broderick Jones injury. Alex, I've heard you reference an injury to the arm of Broderick Jones. Doesn't the NFL require teams to disclose an injury on the injury report? Are the Steelers breaking the rules here or is Jones healthy? I'll let you, I'll let you attack this one. Yeah, it's a fair question. I don't know the exact precise language of the CBA and injury reporting. Um, if a player is not being limited by an injury in any capacity, if he's getting full work, and Jones, to my knowledge, has, he certainly was in training camp, even though he had that elbow and I believe a wrist injury as well, then I, I guess it technically doesn't have to be reported if it's not limiting you. I mean, listen, by like, say, week 16, everyone's hurt. Everyone's dealing with something. If, if by that logic, then your injury report would be just the CVS list of the entire roster, essentially. But if it if it's not Im, it's not impacting you and you're not you know losing reps because of it, then I think basically the NFL can uh can look past that because it's not really playing any games about a player's health and trying to gain any sort of competitive uh, advantage by not listing a player on the injury report. So I imagine the Steelers are aware of what they can and can't list, what they should and should not list, and uh, you know aren't jeopardizing themselves in any any way. All right, Brett writes in, uh, was list, he's listening to Dr. Mel, uh, the terrible takeover the weekend uh, when she was talking about IR uh, players and spots, and she pointed out uh, that the Steelers already have more players on the IR than they have designations to return. He says, here's his question. Could you get a designation back by releasing a guy like Jeremiah Moon, if you wanted to, not saying they will or should, or is he designated to return, or is that burn the moment they designated him before the final roster uh, move? I would, I, I don't know the language of this specifically, but I would think because of uh, both him and Cook going to IR as designated to return as part of that. Um, uh, cut to 53 that, that the NFL now allows the teams to do, uh, that sticks. That's why you have to designate them to return in the moment right there. And in other words, if they were just to release moon, uh, they can't get that back, uh, because it, 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 it sets up a compared, uh, competitive fairness of, well, you just bypass the whole situation here to set your 53 man roster by using a designation to return. And then now you're trying to get that back. So at its core, I would think that uh, they would just burn the designated to return uh, option with him if they, and obviously they won't, uh, if they were to release him. So that knocks that one out. If a guy, number two, if a guy on IR gets healthy, but the team is out of designations or want to save one for another player, how does that work for split salary, et cetera? Can a player force the team to return him or cut him? Uh, I just never seen that situation. I guess what he wants to say is say a guy like, uh, Logan Lee. Just to put a name. All right, Logan Lee. He's on IR on a split salary, but it's not expected to be uh, season ending there. Uh, in other words, can 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 he be forced? Can the team be forced to return him or cut him, or or does he have to return to non-split salary once healthy? My understanding is is that as long as regardless of why he is on IR. Uh, if he stays on IR and he has a split salary clause, too bad. He has to stay on split salary. And if he never gets a return back to the roster as designated return, he just stays on IR uh, on that split salary. Would you interpret that the same way? I would as well. There's a lot of gray area here. Uh, and the designated to return is relatively new. 
Um, could you have a grievance if you're a player and say, hey, I'm healthy. The team won't cut me, allow me to go somewhere else. They're they're keeping me because they can't activate me or does need to return me back. Is there a, a point a player could have? Maybe, but you know, I, I'm not a lawyer. That's I can't, probably uh, all covered in the split salary language for the most part. Or, or to some degree, and it's going to work out in the team's favor in this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, if he stays on IR and he's healthy uh, and they just don't get a chance to re- to, to, to designate the return, he's he's SOL. He's just going to have to take that split salary and wait till next year. Yeah. Uh, the, now- the good thing is this, that the NFL recently, like, you have to designate to return the guys on your 53 when you set it, but after that, you no longer have to declare guys to return. You can just use them at, at your leisure when guys get back healthy, so that does give teams more flexibility to evaluate injuries and health and all that kind of stuff, which is good. Cool. Uh- his last one is, uh, can we expect that the team is probably not going to put anyone on the IR that is not season ending from this point forward? I think that's a dangerous assumption overall, but you better be real judicious at this point of the guys that you do move to IR. And then on top of it, look, you know, you could have a guy like they just opened up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the window today on, on Jeremiah moon, right? Uh, mm-hmm. What happens if God forbid he has some sort of setback, you know, uh, Calvin, Calvin, Calvin is right. Here. Right. You know, and then you obviously they're not designated to return, even though they opened up the window on Jeremiah moon, they still have not burned a designated to return or no, they did on him. Yeah. Uh, who let's, let's put another player in the equation. Let, let's put, uh, uh, Logan, Logan Lee. Lee. Uh, in there, let's say they open up his window to return to practice. Now, here's another uh, bit of that. If he, if he, you know, even though he, even though you open up a window on a player like that, he's still on IR until you designated to return. So even if Logan Lee returned to practice, he would still do so and had his window open. Uh, my assumption would be it would still be on a split salary, and then that he would not come off the split salary until he's officially designated to return. But let's say Logan Lee, you open up the window on him, uh, and he starts practicing, and he has a setback. All right. Well, eventually you're going to burn out that that 21 day window anyway, so he would just stay on IR. You don't use a designated needed to return tag on him. You that, don't, even though he's back practicing, even though he's been declared. Because once you once he's back practicing, you, you I thought you used that designate to return. No, you declared I, him to return. No, I don't. I I don't believe we'll 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 get a we'll get the answer to that today. Really, on on, on the sheet, I, I would think because it, it would list designated to return uh, on there. I think there's two. I'm not one hundred percent sure, but I think there's two points to this process here. I think it's opening the window and then the official move of designated okay. to return. Okay. So opening the window does not declare designated to return. Is that what you're saying? That is my assumption. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying here, the team mentioned that today. They just say in addition, Jeremiah Moon returning to practice, although he's still on the reserve injured list. Okay. So that, okay. I mean, I, I know he has been designated to return uh, because he was already declared right. on the 53, but I'm just kind of, parsing the language okay that, that that's interesting I, I wonder if it applied to calvin his rookie year um because he, that was the scenario that played out with him he, that window opened up he went through it had that setback and and stayed on ir so was he ever officially designated to return i don't think so i can go back and try to search the uh nfl sheet on that uh okay. but i i don't believe so i don't think you use the designated to return until they actually are returned from ir ir okay all right that makes sense that's good clarification now you get a bunch of those you get uh eight in the regular season and up to ten uh two additional for the playoffs um so you do have a lot of flexibility here but those are still still good things to know I, and i get i guess at his core here is uh you know, will this prevent them from putting guys on IR that they might think, you know, ha- have a have a chance to return? I, I just think you got to be very judicious and know the health of all the guys on the roster and what, what they're. I mean, look, Fontana is not expected to come back during the regular season, right? Uh, James Daniels obviously isn't. Uh, let's go down the list real quick. Uh, Logan Lee, uh, uh, you would think has at least a chance. Uh, to come off of uh, IR as a designated to return guy. Uh, Matikavich, uh, obviously Skoranek. Nate uh, Skoranek, 
Uh, Corey Trice Jr. probably has a chance. Uh, Cameron Johnston does not. David Perales does not. So, I mean, how many, how many technically guys that are on IR not named Moon and Cook really have a legitimate chance to be designated to return? Skoranek, Trice, Matikavich, and Lee. So that's four, right? Yeah, and you get up to eight in the regular season. So Cook and Moon, that's six. You would have two additional possibilities. Right, right. So, you know, I, I think you just got to be judicious with it. And uh, I don't think it will necessarily prevent them from placing anybody on IR with the idea that they could return. Uh, it's just you better better know what the uh, long-term uh, chances are. Yeah, and of course, you don't have to designate somebody to return. Lee, you could just say, yeah, we don't want to use it on him. Right. We'll use it on somebody else. So, yeah, I think you could still put guys on IR if they're going to be out four or six weeks and, and not uh, be concerned about that. Because you don't want to have, necessarily have a guy down for four or six weeks and take up that spot if you can free it up uh, with other injuries and maneuvering. And by the way, I should mention uh, there was a Cole Holcomb reference in the Mike Tomlin press conference. Uh, Tomlin really did talk about when Holcomb could come back. We don't expect it to, be, to happen any, anytime soon, but uh, haven't heard his name in a while and so just want to mention that as well he remains on uh reserve pup all right before we uh get to a few more questions here todd archer who covers the cowboys is reporting that uh the cowboys will be without wide receiver brandon cooks for at least this week versus pittsburgh and potentially longer after an infection developed in his right knee following a a procedure he had after remaining in new york so it doesn't Mm. sound like the cowboys are going to have brandon cook uh, this week, uh, Bill Ewan writes in Steeler fans drive me crazy. Three and oh, and making plays. We are going to the Super Bowl. Three point loss that uh, had every chance to win. Fire Tomlin, pick any play, and we probably win. Uh, he writes Pickens fumble, Pickens drop in the end zone, drop pick, fumbled snap. Any one of those happen, and we have a great chance to win. My question is, how do you guys deal with the crazy fans? Uh, I get less and less worried about that aspect the more and more I have done this. It's just part of fandom of any team in general uh, at this point. Uh, Fan is short for fanatic. People are fanatic, not always reasonable uh, within that. Uh, I see it daily on Twitter. I see all the stuff that you're seeing. Uh, I don't, I don't, it doesn't bother me. I, 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 I don't like seeing it. I think it's silly a lot of times. Some of the things people are tweeting, writing, and saying. I just I don't get caught. I don't let it ruin my day. Yeah, I've gotten better with that over time. Still, probably not as good as you in terms of letting it just uh, roll off. I read my mentions a little bit less. I try to still read, mention, and uh, respond back when I can. But yeah, a little less, a little less online. This is probably uh, good for the soul after a loss. Uh, I don't respond to nearly the amount of tweets that I used to <laughs> uh, there. All right. One last one from Taylor Carpenter. Uh, Dave and Alex, happy the sky is falling Monday. Tough game versus the Colts, but I'm not overly concerned with the Steelers as it, it's hard to go 4-0 and in today's NFL. I am, however, concerned with one Mr. Najee Harris. I've been down on him for a couple of years and see him as a plotter, mediocre at best running back. Can you guys take a minute to rank Harris? Versus the rest of the starting running backs in the league, like you have done with quarterbacks in the past. I just feel like we, if we had even a top 15 running back in the league, our offense would be completely different. I think Najee is holding this offense back. Great coverage is always never missed an episode of the podcast. Taylor in Athens, Ohio. Taylor, thank you for the email. I don't feel like going through the process of ranking Najee Harris with the rest of the running backs around the league, but, uh, uh, it is hard to put them in top in any you know you bet you better have a damn good reason to put them in any top ten in in the NFL right? Yeah, I don't have a list in front of me. I imagine Najee would not be in the top ten of my list. Top fifteen, you'd probably get fit. You'd probably get a lot of pushback trying to put them in top fifteen right now. Yeah, I mean, obviously coming off the Colts game, you know, not a good performance. I I, I don't know. He'd probably be somewhere in that fifteen. I mean, I still like Najee. I mean, I, I right. think you know, there was there was just, there was no holes for him in that. There was that no case. holes. There was just period. nothing there. I, I, it's hard to really blame him for for that performance. Uh, all right, uh, appreciate the email, Taylor. Uh, anything else coming in, Alex? As we get to closing in on two hours. 
Chad Johnson says he's going to do a three round fight with James Harrison during the Super Bowl. I don't know if that's true. If he's trolling, I fear that. for Johnson's life if that is accurate. So we're going to look into that a little bit. But that's uh, straight from Chad Johnson's Twitter account. What does Stephen Ace Smith say? Stay off the weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Oh Lord, no way, no way would I do that. Uh, all right. Uh, we will be back on Friday to start talking about Steelers versus Cowboys. Hopefully we'll see if we can get somebody lined up uh, uh, posing beat rider. We'll talk about injury report, all the normal stuff on a Friday. Give you our picks for all the week five games, pick the Steelers game, everything that goes along with that. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Steeler on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, if you like what we do, want to donate, SteedersDepot.com, hit the donate button. Also, if you like an ad-free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad-free button. Follow the directions that way. Until Friday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.